This is a magic square. It consists of every integer between 1 and 9 exactly once. But it also has the property that if I add up, for example, the top row, I get 15. But that is the same sum for every single row, every single column, and both of the two diagonals. Magic squares are indeed kind of magical. Now, three by three magic squares like this one were known to ancient Chinese mathematicians a couple hundred years before Common Era, but you can do a lot bigger than three by three. For example, in this beautiful 16th century engraving, up at the top corner, you can see a four by four magic square where it's got the numbers between one and 16 exactly once and every row, column, and main diagonal adds, in this case, to 34. And the way these are commonly presented is actually a puzzle. If I give you either a 3x3 three three or a 4x4 four four with a bunch of the numbers missing, you have to figure out how can you fill that in to create the magic square. I'd encourage you to pause the video, try it out yourself, can you figure out what the missing numbers should be? Even though these are magic squares, mathematicians do reveal their secret, so let's try to figure out the 3x3 three three one. Because there are six unknowns, I don't want to do all six factorial guesses, I don't want to brute force this. Well, by the end of the video, we're gonna have really powerful tools to do this basically immediately. I want to show how you might do it in sort of an ad hoc way, knowing nothing beyond just the basic rules. Uh, for example, when I was doing this, I noticed that the top row had an eight and four, which added up to 12, and that the right column had a four and a nine that added up to 13. And so when it came to filling in the two remaining pieces, I knew that the one in the top row had to be one bigger than the one in the right column. So like something like two and one would work, or three and two. I can't use anything with fours and sevens, they're already there, but I could do, for example, six and five. Because since the top adds up to 18, the bottom also has to add up to 18, that means that there's a six, we've already used six, this doesn't work. But it turns out one of the other ones does. Three, two, if I now do the bottom row, gets a six, and that's totally fine, I can do that. And then you just fill in the remaining spots that forces the five in the middle, it forces the one in the remaining spot. You can check it, this is a magic square. But there's no guarantee that ad hoc method is gonna generalize to all of these puzzles and certainly gets more complicated in the four by four case if you tried that one. So what can we do? Well, in this video, what I'm really gonna lead to, spoilers, is a theorem that says there are some number, we'll figure out the number as we go along, of possible three by three squares up to rotations and reflections. We'll talk about those. Now, if you want to pause and try to prove this theorem all on your own, I encourage you to do that. But for spoilers, I'm going to break it up with a couple different lemmas. I'm gonna first show that the addition of the rows to 15, like we saw in the examples, always happens. It's always gonna add up to 15. And secondly, you might have noticed in our examples, the center thing was always a five. And again, that is also a lemma. The center number always has to be a five. To prove our lemma, we're gonna to need to know the sum of the numbers between one and nine, which you could compute out if you so wished. But I wanna show you as a side tangent, a really fast way to be able to do this. I noticed that the one and the nine add up to 10, as does the two and the eight, as does the three and the seven and the four and the six. And as a result, the sum of the first nine numbers is just the four tens, which is 40, and the five, which was left out, 45. There's an infamous story about the great polymath Gauss, who was able to, in elementary school, add up one to 100 using basically this exact same trick incredibly quickly. And what he did was notice that the first and last number, one in 100, adds up to 101 as does two and 99, as does three and 98, all the way down to the middle where 50 and 51 also add up to 101. So as a result, it's just 101, well, 50 times because only half of the numbers are needed to get each pairing. And then we can use summation notation to get this nice general result where the sum of the first n numbers, well, you take pairs of numbers and add them up to be n plus one, and since it takes two things to make one pair, there's n divided by two copies of this n plus one. So let's prove our first lemma, the sum of the rows or the columns or the diagonals all add up to 15. Well, if I leave it generic, ABC here is meant to say I haven't figured out which of those are one, which of those are two, and so forth. But if I add up the first row, the second row, and the third row, then I've got every single number once, as in the sum of those three rows is every single number. So if I call the sum of a single row a generic number like s, that means that three copies of s better equal 45, which is just the sum of the numbers between one and nine, as we computed earlier. If three s is 45, then s is 15. The sum of all the rows is 15. 
And by definition of the magic square, the sum of the columns and the main diagonals are also 15. I can generalize this to an n by n magic square just the same, where now I'm talking about the number between 1 and n squared. But again, if I look at the sum of all of the different rows, say so each individual row is equal to s, then what I have is n copies of s is all of the numbers between 1 and n squared added together. But by our, our formula, I'm just plugging in n squared now, so this is the same thing as n squared, n squared plus 1 divided by 2. Cancel it out on both sides, and now I know that the sum is n times n squared plus 1 divided by 2. For example, in the 4 by 4 case, 4 squared is 16 plus 1 is 17, 17 times 2 is 34, so as we saw in our earlier image, the sum of every row and column in the main diagonals in a 4 by 4 case is 34. All right, so we have managed to prove our first lemma, and we even talked about how this first lemma generalizes to the 4 by 4 case. Next lemma is about the center number being 5. I'm going to do a similar trick. I'm going to start with a generic magic square here. And then I'm going to think about every row, every column, or every diagonal that intersects with that central number. That includes the e, which is my placeholder for the center number. Okay, so if I add all of those four things up, I'm adding four different rows, columns, or a diagonal. So this better equal to 4 times 15. We've already decided that 15 was the number that has to be for all these rows, columns, and diagonals. And then if I look at the letters, I notice that every one between the first and the ninth is used exactly once, with the exception of e that's used four times. Or another way to say this is, every number is used exactly once, and then the thing in the middle has three additional usages when I write it this way. So that is to say, that the sum of the first numbers plus three times e is equal to, well, four copies of 15 or 60. So I can compute that out, that was just 45, this leaves me with 3e being 15, and now I've deduced e has to be 5. And so we showed our second lemma. The central number is just 5. Okay, now to my theorem. I want to use these lemmas to figure out the total number of 3 by 3 magic squares. Let's start with a generic grid. We know the center point, that's a 5, we can fill that in already. Let me conjecture that I was to put a 1 in a corner. Could be any of the four corners, I'll do this one. Going along that diagonal, that means I have to have a 9 in the final spot to be able to add up to 15. Now let's think about the top row. It's got a 1 in it, so the other two numbers better add up to 14. Can include a 9, can include 7 plus 7, that would be a repetition. So there's only two possibilities. It could be 6 and 8, or it could be 8 and 6. Those are the two possibilities for that top row. But neither of these is valid. Because if I now look at the far right row, well, 6 and 9 is already 15, I'd have to put a 0 in. And if the 6 and the 8 swap, it would be even worse, I'd have to put a negative number in. Neither is possible. And if I put the 1 in any of the other corners, the same problem happens. You cannot put a 1 in the corner. Okay, so let's put the 1 in one of those middle outside locations, like this one. Same story, 1, 5, 9 has to add up. And let's again look at that top row. Again, it has to be either 6 and 8 or 8 and 6. So how about I do it this way? One I'm going to write down is 6 and 8, and then I'm actually going to copy it over and do 8 and 6. I'm going to do both of these at the same time. So I had a choice here, but after this choice, everything is fixed. Going down that 8, 5 diagonal means there's a 2 in the opposite diagonal, and I've got the 2 and the 9, and that's going to mean a 4 along the bottom, and I can fill in the 7 and the 3 as well. Both of these are magic squares, so they're two bona fide answers. But you notice I had that little bit in there about up to reflection and rotation. Well, this is what I mean. These two magic squares are just reflections of each other. So if I get rid of thinking about reflections, then they're just the same magic square, sort of up to reflections. The same story if I consider one of them. I could just rotate the numbers so that the one is in a different middle location. And so the idea is that up to rotation, all of these things are exactly the same. And as a result, because there's four possible middle locations for the one, and then two possible six, eight pairs for each of those, there's sort of eight magic squares, but if you ignore rotations and reflections, we get to our final result, there is one possible 3x3 three three magic square. And what I find crazy about this is that while this was simple for 3x3, three three, look how quickly this gets complicated. For 4x4, four four, there are 880 possible magic squares. It's way less prescribed. We have seen one lemma already in terms of the sum of the rows being 34, and you can play around to try to find other things that must be true about 4x4s, but there's way more options. Turns out 880. 
and it grows fast. Like for a five by five, there's 275 million possibilities. And here's my favorite part. For six by six, we do not know. The number is so gargantuan, like statistical estimates sort of estimated around 10 to the 19, that we don't actually have a way to mechanistically compute it out on our computers so far. It's just too big. And so magic squares start extremely simple and get really complicated. Now, if you enjoyed today's math puzzles and want to do more, want to get better at math, then I strongly recommend today's sponsor, Brilliant.org. Brilliant is an online learning platform with thousands of lessons, from foundational to advanced mathematics, but also stuff like AI, data science, neural networks, and more. What I really enjoy about Brilliant is just how interactive their lessons are, whether that's controlling a beautiful animation, or the constant tests of knowledge that Brilliant sprinkles throughout the lesson to make sure you have truly mastered the material. As a math professor, I know that this kind of active, student-centered learning is fantastic for learning the mathematics, and it's why I'm so proud to be sponsored by Brilliant. To try everything that Brilliant has to offer for free for a full 30 days, go to brilliant.org slash Trevor Bazzett or click the link down in the description. And the first 200 of you to click that link are gonna get an additional 20% off an annual premium subscription. With that said, I hope you enjoyed the video. If you have any questions, leave them down in the comments below and we'll do some more math in the next video.